So, have you all ever seen something that was just amazing? That you were like, whoa, I can't believe that just happened. Did you ever see anything like that? What did you see? Um, fireworks. Fireworks. Oh, yeah. When fireworks happen, it's like, oh, wow. Right? What else have you seen that's just amazing? What did you see? A rainbow. Oh, those are great, right? Rainbows are just beautiful. You're like, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. What did you see? Flowers and pretty things when we're riding our bikes. Oh, yes, they make us pause and just like, it's so beautiful. What about you? I had a roller coaster. A roller coaster? Yeah. Woo! Right? That's pretty amazing. So I saw something amazing, and it's, uh, I saw somebody play music with their feet. What? I know. Oh, I, well, I saw somebody play music with their feet. And you know what? They're in this room right now. <gasps> Where? Where do you think the person is that can play music with their feet? Does anybody know? Who is it? Shelby. Oh, oh, let's go see her play music with her feet. Come on. Come on, everybody. Join me over here. Come on. Come on. Let's go around here and look. Watch. No hands. She's not going to use her hands. And let's see her. Come on. You can come on up here. We're going to watch her play. <gasps> Look at that. Isn't that amazing? It's pretty. It's amazing, right? She's not using her hands. I promise. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. And she wants to retire. Oh. <laughs> so, today we're going to be talking about the disciples. And they have this moment where they're just so excited. And they see something so amazing. And there's nothing wrong when those amazing things happen. It's not like that's a bad thing. But Jesus is going to challenge them to maybe look at things a little differently. That not everything is all about just being surprised and amazed. That there's a lot of other things that we're supposed to be looking at and called to see. So listen in their sermon today. Can we pray? Thank you, gracious God, for your amazing gifts and your talents and all inspiring moments. Be with us as we hear you speak to us today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. When I was a kid, um, in my neighborhood, somebody was throwing away a perfectly good bow, like a bow and arrow. It was a straight bow. It's about six feet tall. And I grabbed it out of the trash can and ran home and showed my father my newfound weapon of choice. <laughs> and said, can I shoot it? Can we do it? And he was hesitant, and it took a couple of weeks of convincing him. He didn't know that in my mind, every night I would go to bed thinking that some would-be robber was going to come in and try to take things, and I was going to string that bow and defend the house. So he finally said, it's okay, we can do this. And so we went down to this range, and, and uh, they, they helped me to learn how to string a straight bow. If you've never done that, that's a task. And I almost knocked my head clean off doing it. It is really, really difficult to bend that thing over and to attach it. But once I finally got it and it was all taut, he gave me an arrow with a very blunt end. And he says, okay, son, go ahead and shoot that uh, barrel, which is about the size of the altar frontal here. And I pulled back that string and I had the arrow in there and I let go and it went straight over the, end, the thing. It didn't even hit, hit the target at all. And he looked at me and says, well, are you aiming? And I said, yes, sir, I'm looking right at the target. And he goes, which eye are you using? And I said, both eyes. And he says, you need to use your dominant eye. What's my dominant eye? So he helped me to consider what that was. Okay, so my dominant eye is, he said, I want you to make an okay sign with your hand. I want you to look at that target. And then I want you to close your eye. And whichever eye is on that target, that's your dominant eye. So, okay, Lutherans, let's practice this. I want you to look up at the cross, choir, if that works for you, great. If not, you can look up at, the, at the, uh, the, the dove. And I want you to make a little okay sign and leave your hand where it is. Don't move your hand. That was happening in other services. Your hand stays still. Your eyes open and close. And whichever one has the center of the cross in it, that's your dominant eye. So how many of y'all have a dominant eye that's on your right side? How many of y'all have the left eye? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's both, right? Even if you're right-handed, it could be your left eye. <gasps> oh, that's so weird, right? So now for the rest of the service, you're going to be doing that. And it's okay. <laughs> so I took the bow. I put another arrow in it. 
And I pulled back, and I began to aim with my dominant eye, and I let that arrow fly, and it went straight over the target again. And we took the bow home, we unstrung it, and I never shot another arrow. Yeah. <laughs> so, today in the gospel lesson, the disciples are looking at the world through their dominant eye. It's just the way they know how to see it. It makes the most sense to them. It's the most comfortable for them. That's how they are looking at things. And Jesus is going to challenge them to look at it a little differently. And we've been watching this happen. We talked about it last week. Jesus has these followers, and he's saying, listen to what I've been saying to these people. All these Pharisees and these Sadducees and scribes, they're trying to trap me with their words. Remember that one scribe that we saw, that he was close to the kingdom of God because he understood that loving God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and loving your neighbor as yourself is greater than any offering we can offer. It's greater than any sacrifice that can be given. It is closest to the kingdom of God. And then he points at all the other scribes, and he says, watch out for those that are wearing long robes and want to have the best seats and are saying these huge prayers. They're taking advantage of the most vulnerable people among us. Like widows, they're devouring their houses. And then at this on cue, a widow shows up and takes her two coins to the place that has taken everything else. And she gives those coins. And then he turns to the disciples and they walk out of the temple. And the disciples grab Jesus and they say, look at it. Look at this beautiful building. Look at these stones. Isn't it amazing? Now, I'm going to give them a little bit of grace here because at that point in time, it was probably the biggest thing they had seen. Imagine where they lived in little huts and, and, and shelters and not more than six feet tall and stuff. That if all of a sudden they came across this building in Jerusalem that had stones the size of semi-trailers, it probably looked amazing. I was trying to think of what, what could we compare that to. And, and years ago, my family went to the Grand Canyon. And we got there right at dusk. And we walked up. And we all were just <gasps> awestruck. I mean, I knew it was going to be big. But I thought it was just going to be a hole in the ground. No, this thing was huge. And we just looked at the vastness of it. It just amazed and just caught up in that awe. So I get it. I get it. These disciples are starstruck by, by the size and the mass and the, and the importance of it. More so, these disciples know that they're with the guy that is supposed to kick out all the Romans and take charge of this beautiful palace where they're going to get to put on the robes and have the seats of honor and say the long prayers. So Jesus looks at them and he says, all these stones are going to be toppled over. They're not going to stand. And then he goes and he sits opposite of the temple. And they look at him and they say, when? When is this going to happen? And Jesus is challenging them to think of it from a little different perspective. He says, you guys need to watch out for people that are going to come and, and say that they're me, or that they're the Messiah, or that they're going to lead you astray, or that they're going to you know, stroke your ego a little bit, you know, play to your hubris and, and make you feel really important and th say things like, you know, if you do good, God loves you. If you do bad, God doesn't love you. And, and, and they're going to lead you astray. But follow me. Bad things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen. Follow me. This is like birth pangs. It's going to continue to happen throughout your lifetime. There will be a time when new life will come, when that birth will happen. But until then, there's going to be pain. That's not going to stop. Wars will happen. Famine will happen. Earthquakes will happen. These things are going to happen. Follow me. But they can't see it because they're stuck looking at it in their dominant eye. Jesus is asking them to close one of those eyes and look at it differently. Do me a favor. Close your dominant eye. Put your hand over your dominant eye. Go ahead. Put your hand over your dominant eye. Close that eye. Imagine right now looking with that non-dominant eye. If you had to stand up and walk out of this sanctuary, all of us at the same time. And then we went out into the parking lot and we all got into our cars all at the same time. And we had to drive home using only our non-dominant eye. It would be chaotic. I'm a little dizzy right now. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a difficult thing to do because I can't do that. I have a hard time doing that. Jesus is saying, yeah, it's hard. You need help. Let me help you. Follow me. Let me lead you. Follow me. This past week, I was reading a devotion, and, uh, and it reminded me, and it's been sticking with me, and in, 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 it's part of this sermon, is that the phrase is, let go and let God. Let go and let God. Because God is in the business of letting Think about the story of creation. What does it say 
when the earth was formless and void, God said, what? Let there be light, right? Let the stars appear, let the, let the waters form, let, the all, let, 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 let it all happens. God is in the process of letting. We are to participate in it. God has created something for us to participate with. Are we letting God do that, or are we only going to look at it from our perspective and not want to go to the perspective that God is inviting us to? Here's another way to consider it, too. Like, you can think about what's happened yesterday, three days ago, six months ago, a year ago, and look back on the past and see where God was active. Think of Footprints in the Sand poem, right? We've all read that one before. If you haven't, look it up. But you can, you can look backwards and see where God was actively involved in your life, and, and it was beautiful, and you were just participating, and, and you were letting go of some stuff, and God was acting, and you were just, and it was like serene and beautiful, and you, you can't explain it, even though bad things were still happening around you. You felt the presence of the divine. Well, the same thing holds true in the future. That same God is available in the future. Are we willing to let go and let God when that time comes? Because God's waiting to meet us wherever it is that we're going. No matter where it is that we go, God's already there. Yes, there's going to be problems. Yes, there's going to be wars. Nations will rise against nations. Earthquakes will happen. But there is new life to be had through our Lord and Savior if we let go and let God. The problem is, it's much more comfortable for me to just do it. I mean, thanks God, I got it. Wow, right? How can we practice that today? Maybe maybe we need to try and stand and walk a little bit and feel that sense of uncomfortability and recognize that God is already active right now. Maybe today we can practice letting go and letting God. Amen.